Oh, let's be standing for the introduction. I was asking a question, and, it, and it's a question that management deals with. I had a manager who believed that all people are basically good and they need encouragement. And I had another manager that believed that all people were basically lazy and they needed to kick somewhere south. Um, but, but that is a theological question as well. And I'd love for you to look in your heart right now and say, am I basically good or inherently bad? And if you said yes, uh, you would agree <laughs> with <laughs> the little nursery rhyme about uh, little Mary. You remember that? She was quite contrary, and that was one. Then there was another one. Why is it always the girls that get the bad things? But she had a little curl in the middle of her forehead, and when she was good, she was... And when she was bad, she was... Horrid. So the question is, are you very good or horrid? And the answer is probably yes. But, but I prefer to think that we're very good. That that's God's intention for us. And in spite of some of our horrid tendencies, we're on the trajectory with the help of God's spirit to be very good. So turn to the person next to you and say, I believe that though you, I just believe you're very good. <laughs> you're very good. No, thank you. Thank you. All right, be seated, please. Now be good. Um, so you're just a bunch of do-gooders. I see. And why not? Why not follow the ultimate do-gooder? Not in the sense of someone who is stumbling in trying to do good when they don't know how to do good, although that has that connotation but somebody who is really trying to do good. And when we think about the heart of Jesus, we have to think about goodness. And we read in Acts chapter 10, verses 34 through 38, a description as Peter is addressing the household of Cornelius concerning Jesus. Peter began to speak. He said, I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism. You would think that if you're really good, he would show favoritism towards you. And if you were really bad, he would show the opposite, his disfavor. But that's not true. God doesn't show favoritism. But accepts men and women from every nation who fear him and do what is right. You know the message God sent to the people of Israel, telling the good news of peace through Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. You know what has happened throughout Judea, beginning in Galilee, after the baptism that John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power and how he went about doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil because God was with him. Jesus was very good. Though he was tempted with all the horrid things that we are tempted with. The Bible says he was tempted in all points like as we are, yet without sin. So he was tempted to make a decision that was wrong. He entertained this idea, but he rejected it every time. And that's what made his life perfect. But notice he was anointed with the power of the Holy Spirit. And when he was anointed with the power of the Holy Spirit, what changed in his life? Well, we don't know very much about his first 30 years, do we? There's that incident at the temple when he's a baby and they go for the purification and Anna and Simeon prophesy concerning him and concerning Mary. We know at age 12 he is found in the temple while his parents are going home arguing and answering and discussing with the great scholars of the day. But he goes back to Nazareth and he grows in wisdom and stature and favor of God and man. But we know very little about his life. He's working in the carpentry shops for all that we know. His father Joseph being, is not this the carpenter's son, is a statement that some people that were incredulous about his greatness were asking. But when was it that he began to really do the good for which we remember him? That the gospel writers Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John record all this goodness. Wasn't it after his baptism at John, as he says here, when he was anointed with the power of the Holy Spirit, and then he went about doing good and rescuing people from the clutches of the devil. He went about doing good. 
I think it's important for us to see God as a do-gooder. As someone who every day, out of the abundance and goodness of his heart, gives what we need. What we need. And Jesus is an expression of the goodness of God in that this good God sent this good person to die a horrible death that we might enter into a good life. But we must not leave out the work of the Holy Spirit. For it is the Holy Spirit that empowered Jesus to really become powerful in doing good. Could it be that a lot of people go to church, but we're powerless. We're horrid sometimes when we could have been good. But we weren't listening to the power of the Holy Spirit within us. We didn't know. We didn't realize that we had this anointing of the Holy Spirit that would empower us to change within and to do good without. As we look into the heart of Jesus, this chest representing all the goodness within his heart, for in Jesus are all the treasures of the wisdom and riches of God. We see a heart filled with the Holy Spirit. In Matthew chapter 3, beginning in verse 16, we read that Jesus was baptized. And as soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. And at that moment, heaven was opened. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. And what happened? Immediately after the Spirit comes in with power into the life of Jesus. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the desert to be tempted by the devil. You see, there is within us the human nature to do that which opposes God. And there is within us a spirit also within us that longs for all, what only God can provide. And it is only with the giving of the Holy Spirit that we are able to overcome that which is horrid. And more and more choose that which is good. Now you could raise your hand along with me if you're still doing horrid. Yeah, that's just part of our lives. But we want to do less horrid and more good. And as we, as we latch on to this relationship with this indwelling of the Spirit, which is Jesus and the Father within us, then we can be led by the Spirit if we so choose. It's our will. He doesn't take over us and make us do that which is good, but he prompts us and leads us and empowers us when we in our will choose to do what is good. And when Jesus was baptized, he received that Spirit and he immediately began to be led. You would think that he would have been led into some palace where he'd have a nice meal and sit down and study the Old Testament scriptures surrounded by friends. But no, the Spirit led him into the wilderness because there is something that had to be done. Jesus had to face his humanity. He had to face the temptation to be horrid. He had to face the temptation to have a life that he could build himself with the powers of evil, the material powers of this world that would be great and he could enjoy immediately. And Satan tempted him in all of these ways. But yet he answered each time with some cleansing word of the scripture. Get behind me, Satan. Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. It's the same with us. When we become a Christian and we're baptized and we receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, we're not led into palaces of ease. We're led into a real life and death struggle within ourselves. Whether we're going to be the good that the Holy Spirit can empower us to be, or we're going to give in, resist, and reject the leading of the Holy Spirit and become all that our human nature sometimes wants desperately to be. And I confess to you that I very often do not follow the leading of the Spirit and am horrid. But it's not what I want. I want that goodness that God created me to be, and I believe you feel the same way, and that's why you're here. In John chapter 3 and verse 34, we read that the one whom God has sent speaks the words of God, for God gives the Spirit without limit. Jesus needed the special administration of the Holy Spirit to do all that he had to do, to prove his deity, to go to the cross, 
to be a perfect sacrifice, and he received this power through the Holy Spirit. But it's not just for Jesus. As we look into the heart of Jesus and we see that he is filled with the Holy Spirit, that's not just for him. And then he dies for us, and we accept that sacrifice, and we continue alternately between good and horrid. That's not his plan for us. He who saved us from the penalty of sin must necessarily also desire and design to save us from the practice of sin more and more. Not sinless, but sinning less. This is the power of the Holy Spirit. And it's even beyond the being horrid or the being good. It is being a fountain of blessing as we see Jesus was when the Spirit was in his life. So Jesus promised that you would receive this gift of the Holy Spirit. In John chapter 7, we read that he is in the, he is in the Feast of the Tabernacles, which was a fall festival where they really prayed for rain. Seven days. For six days, they would go down to the spring of Gihon, and, and the priest would bring back a pitcher of water, and people would, would uh, sing a passage from Isaiah, uh, With joy we draw water from the wells of salvation. And they would sing the ascending psalms. And when they would come to the altar, the priest would pour out this water on the altar. And they would do this for six days, and on the seventh day, they would do this seven times. And it was on this occasion that Jesus stood up in this crowd and he cried out with a loud voice, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, streams of living water will flow from within him. By this, he meant the Spirit whom those who believed in him were later to receive. Up to that time, the Spirit had not been given since Jesus had not been glorified. No, it's not just Jesus who received the empowering of the Holy Spirit. He said that if we come to him, if we will accept and believe in him, if we will obey him out of our belly, the original version says, out of within our heart will flow rivers of living water. This, he said, is the Holy Spirit. When you fill up something, it's possible to fill something so that it has nothing to give. That is, it's not overflowing. It's simply full. It's possible for us to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit and be content with our infilling of the Holy Spirit. But Jesus says that the Holy Spirit is given not just for our experience and our feelings, although that's important, but that the Spirit is given so that from us might flow the blessings of the Holy Spirit to other people. Isn't this what we see in the life of Jesus? Don't we see someone who not only received the Spirit and was filled with the Spirit, but someone who immediately began to test his human nature against the forces of this world and emerged victorious? And don't we see him going from there to Nazareth when he stands up in the synagogue and he quotes from Isaiah and says, I'm going to help the powerless and the weak. And do we not then see him allowing the spirit to flow in overflow from his life out to all of the sick, the maimed, the crippled, the, the difficult ones, the, one, the powers of, the, of Satan? Do we not see him resisting the evils of religion as it had devolved? The Holy Spirit is given to empower us to show the love of God to others. God who is that good God, that loving God. Jesus, that expression of that good loving God. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And the Holy Spirit continues in that same expression of love. And when we are filled with the Spirit, what are we filled with? Romans chapter five says that it is the Holy Spirit that has poured the love of God in our hearts. It's only because of God's love and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit that we can really love like God loves. And that love that loves the unlovely, that loves the mean church member, <laughs> that loves the preacher anyway, you know, that loves the lost, that loves the unlovable, that loves indeed the enemy, that loves the whole world. This is the reflection of God. And Jesus healed all the sick that were brought to him. He, he gave of himself, but it was not through his own power that he was doing this. It was only when he was empowered. Do you believe that when you've received the Holy Spirit, 
that you're empowered, that you can give love to this world? You can. You can. I received a letter along with some others from Sasha this past week. Sasha Prokopchuk does a weekly television program in Ukraine every Sunday morning and again on Wednesday night. It's, it's cryptic, it's um, short, it's brief. Let me, let me read it exactly as he wrote it and you follow as best we can. Job meetings, family meetings, friends meetings, but there are such meetings that we don't plan. Usually we call them unexpected meetings. Let's look at unexpected meeting and all that happens from another perspective. Perhaps this case presents us with God. He wants to tell us something important. Such moments could be called life lessons or even Bible studies. March 14th, Monday, Ukraine, Kiev, TV studio. I am recording two programs. One of them is about talents, Matthew chapter 25. This topic is very familiar for all people who know the gospel texts. What new can there be there? Bright light, two cameras looking at me. I ask the viewers to read Matthew 25, 15 and pay attention to the words of Christ, each according to his own ability. This means that every disciple of Jesus has talent. Every one of us has an ability and God's gift to increase what God entrusted us. The first 10 minutes of recording passes very quickly. TV crew lets me know there's one minute left. I come to the conclusion and the calling. God wants us to do good and he wants to do good through us. The TV program recording is over. On my way home, I decided to stop at the supermarket, like Walmart. Bread, milk, and what else do I need? I thought, walking through the aisles, I stopped to get some juice. I got a glass bottle with apple juice looking for the ingredients and expiration date. At this moment, I heard a child's voice so quiet that I didn't get it. I saw a little girl. Hello, I said, do you want something? I want a chocolate bar very much, said the girl. What is your name? Sophia. How old are you? Nine, said Sophia. We talked for a while and I got to know that Sophia's mom died and she doesn't have a dad. She's living with her grandma. Sophia doesn't get to go to school even. I was talking to the girl and at the same time heard my TV message about talents in my head. It looked like heaven decided to test me. What is easier? To beautifully talk about good or actually do something, though small. Together, we went to the aisle where they sell chocolate. What chocolate do you like? I asked the little angel. Sophia looked it all through and pointed to Milka. Okay, you can have it and let's go now and pay for it. I put all my purchases before the cashier and first I gave her a chocolate bar. Then I gave chocolate bar to Sophia. She was not leaving. She was waiting for me to pay and then we went together to the exit. She smiled and continued talking. Sophia's eyes shined with joy and happiness. Not much and yet everything. The Holy Spirit is speaking to us in the loving acts we are being urged to do. And he is asking us to overcome our insidious, horrid impulses to protect ourselves, to lash out, to seek revenge, to be petty, to be selfish, to be comfortable, and to follow Jesus whose heart was full of the Holy Spirit. When he stood up there and said, out of you will flow these rivers of living water, but he meant out of you will flow the spirit of God, the spirit of love. That's an amazing thing. Ezekiel chapter 47 is the prophecy. The man brought me back to the entrance of the temple. And I saw water coming out from under the threshold of the temple. 
toward the east for the temple faced east. The water was coming down from under the south side of the temple, south of the altar. This was in part the commemoration of this prophecy. When the priest poured that, that water on the altar, it was a, a reaffirmation that not only did the Israelites drink from the rock when they were in the wilderness and Moses brought water in that arid land out of a rock and quenched the thirst of all of the children of Israel, but also the prophecy that out of this very place where we're pouring this will issue a stream of life-giving water. And Jesus stood up right then and he said, I'm that one. I'm the one. And when I'm glorified, I will send the Spirit and this water will flow from this very place. And Jesus was killed in Jerusalem, buried, and rose again, and nearby ascended into heaven and sent the gift of the Holy Spirit. And we now see the effects of the Spirit in the lives of people. In Ezekiel 47, verse 9, so where the river flows, everything will live. Ezekiel was taken out, and there was a guy measuring the depth of the water. And at first it was ankle deep. You can read this in Ezekiel 47. And then they went a little further, and it was knee deep. And then they went a little further and measured again, and it was waist deep. And then you could swim in it. And then it was such a river that no man could swim. And this is the river that flows to create life, that changes salt water to fresh. We have ourselves in the Holy Spirit all the help we need to be good, to be saved, and perhaps more importantly, to be like Jesus in blessing other people. Even though sometimes we're horrid, God still allows us to be a channel of blessing and of his love. And this is a miraculous thing in our eyes. In John chapter 14, 15, and 16, Jesus speaks of the Holy Spirit. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever. The word is comforter. And notice he says, I will give you another comforter. Who was the first one? It was Jesus. But he's leaving. And he says, I'm going to give you another. The Greek word there, alos, means of the same type. Not hetero, not a different kind of comforter, but exactly the same kind of comforter that Jesus had been with the disciples. Only this comforter will be in us. When the comforter comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who goes out from the Father, he will testify about me. But I tell you the truth, it is for your good that I'm going away. Unless I go away, the comforter will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. The Father in his goodness, Jesus in the expression of that goodness, and the Holy Spirit in the overflowing of that goodness in our hearts. This is the Christian's heritage. And for us to say, sometimes I'm good, sometimes I'm horrid, it's not good enough, is it? It's living so far below the potential of which we have to be a blessing to others. 1 John chapter 2 and verse 1 says that Jesus is our defense. He also our comforter. In Romans chapter 7, verses 18 and 19, we're reminded of the negativity that is possible within us. I know that nothing good lives in me that is in my sinful nature. That is in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. No, we can't. It's only through the Spirit's empowering that we can. For what I do is not the good I want to do. No, the evil I do not want to do. This I keep on doing. Paul is describing his life apart from the gift of the Holy Spirit. He continues in Romans 8. But there is now no condemnation in Christ who have been freed from the law of sin and death and are following the law of the Spirit now. As we think about the disciples, when they had Jesus, they were arguing. They were fighting among themselves about who was the greatest. They were fearful. Peter gets accosted by a little girl, and, and he starts denying Jesus. And all of them run away and hide. But what happens after they receive the gift of the Holy Spirit as promised? They stand up without fear of even their own lives and say, before all the rulers, we're going to preach Jesus and we ought to obey God rather than men. And we begin to see them begin to live the lives of love that allow them to pen the wonderful words in 1 John and in 1 and 2 Peter. And so when we come to Sasha's letter today, we're reminded that the goodness that is possible in us is as great as our faith in the working of the Holy Spirit in us. 
It's very easy to see that Jesus had this power and that he exercised it. It's harder to believe him when he said that you can have it and that out of your heart will flow these rivers of living water that will refresh all around you as you yourself are being refreshed. And so the challenge today is for us to lead a rebellion. We must lead a rebellion in our own heart. We're always ready to fight City Hall. We're always ready to fight the government. We're always ready to fight the evil without. But God calls us to lead a rebellion in our own heart first and continually and plant a flag there in that citadel that is for Jesus and for the goodness that he brings. I want to read Galatians chapter 5 as it talks about this battle. So I say, live by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of sinful nature. For the sinful nature desires what is contrary to the Spirit and the Spirit what is contrary to the sinful nature. They are in conflict with each other so that you do not uh, do what you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. The acts of the sinful nature are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there's no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the sinful nature with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. And so Jesus promised this spirit. And in Acts chapter 2, Peter preaching in that first sermon after the resurrection of Jesus, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So Paul could write in Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 16, I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being. Let us pray. Lord, we claim the promise and believe it and help our unbelief that indeed you've given us an empowering spirit, the same spirit that empowered you to live such a noble and even perfect life to be a perfect sacrifice for us. We thank you for cleansing us continually by your blood for all the times that we are horrid, that you forgive us immediately through the power of your blood and the spirit continues to indwell us and and lead us gently home. Lead us gently to that good act of love that you're calling us to be and to do. Lord, we ask you to help us to believe that each one of us here has that empowering Holy Spirit who is a Christian today and can work this out in our daily life in all of our expected meetings and all that are unexpected. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.